Hey, pals, we just want to say thank you to all our fans that support us out there. If you want to become a supporter and you like to support us through the value for value proposition, we provide value and we would love to see you give us some value back. You can see all the ways that you can do that at Patreon. You can check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash go with the heat. Now let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. Believe it or not, this is the last episode of the Crockett Amnesia story arc. I'm sad. I'm going to miss the ponytail. <laughs> Just a little bit. I, I really enjoyed it. He got stuff done. He was effective. <laughs> <laughs> Efficient, really, like. He didn't kill that many people, but still struck fear into the hearts of everyone. I like how he didn't kill that many mm-hmm. people. He did murder a lot. <laughs> many people. <laughs> well, this we is don't have an exact count. It's probably <laughs> somewhere in the 30s. Not that many people. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is season five, episode two, titled Redemption in Blood. It originally premiered on November 11th, 1988. It is written by Robert Ward. He's got seven more episodes coming that he's going to write in season five. He's all up in season five. <laughs> yes. He is also the co-executive producer with Michael Mann of the show. So question. Where has he been all this where time? Where has Robert Ward been? <laughs> <laughs> he's going to write eight episodes in season five total. And he's co-executive producer. Was it just like now that Dick Wolf is gone? It's like, cool. Now no one's paying attention. I can get my stuff in. I don't know. It's not saying a lot for Dick Wolf. Uh, I think it's... <laughs> I think it's now that Dick's gone, Michael Mann can hire all of his buddies back. (laughs) Yeah, because this guy did write for Crime Story. Oh, well, there you go. (laughs) It is directed by Paul Krasny, who also has one more episode coming. And for both of these men, just like last week, it was their first thing they've ever done with Vice as far as writing or directing. So like I said, essentially no one from the previous season is going to come back. We're going to be saying a whole bunch that this was their first and they have this many more to go in season five. They really went deep on the bench on this one. Like they came out, the the manager came out tapping his right arm and like, there ain't no more righties out here. I was like, all right, so how many lefties you got? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I was going to say, like, is that necessarily a bad thing that no one's coming back? (laughs) I mean, from season four, it's true. Yeah, I mean... (laughs) Maybe they just do what they had to do. <laughs> Before we get started, I could check into what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, we missed something that happened a few weeks ago. There was rumors swirling that an ALF reboot is coming. Just let that sink in for a moment. Hmm. ALF. I do not like hmm. that. <laughs> do not touch ALF. It feels ALF. like... <laughs> We should have caught this, you know, a couple weeks ago. What, three, four, <laughs> five weeks ago? Yeah, when I it mean, came I don't out. know. <laughs> Feels like we should have, but we missed it. I don't know. Yeah, it was just, it just so survived. I guess <laughs> the 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 controversy I heard with this is that I guess there was some leaked footage. This is a long time ago, but there was some leaked footage out after the series closed. Of them just go around on set, and I guess they had the elf character say some well questionable things that might not jive in today's Twitter society. <laughs> so, Are you saying elf is a racist? There have been questions. <laughs> yeah, I'm saying that there have been questions about certain comments, racial comments that came out <laughs> of the show. I'm just saying, is it what is the percentage that they're going to Roseanne Alf? Like, they're just going <laughs> to cancel it before it gets going. Here's my biggest concern with an Alf reboot. So there's rumors now, like, a Frasier reboot. And I think what's happening is that Fuller House comes out popular. And then Will and Grace comes out even more popular. Roseanne comes out, blows the roof off the building. And so now every studio is getting their old sitcoms ready to go will reboot these if this trend continues. And my biggest concern with ALF is they don't do the puppet. Yeah, they're going to do CGI ALF. Mm-hmm. Mm. As long as we make it to the Crossing Jordan reboot, I'll be okay. <laughs> well, I'm not okay with it. Leave ALF alone. <laughs> I loved ALF. I love that little alien from planet Melmac. But <laughs> no. I think Woody's looking for work, and I'm sure Jill Hennessy isn't busy. Um, NBC. <laughs> it's really pushing for this. You gotta start like a campaign going. Like, get, I mean, get they'll go deep. Campaign. They already proved they'll go deep because of the Voltron reboot and Ultraman. And I mean, it's just saying like nostalgia is high right now. 
and basically anything and everything could possibly happen. But I know for sure that one thing that come won't on, happen, Melissa, come on, Melissa, this is good. This is good for TV. We might finally get our Las Vegas closure. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> that was a good show, and they just left us hanging. <laughs> They just left us hanging. What was it? Was it the wedding was the last episode? Yeah, I think it was the wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Me and John know. <laughs> Nerds. <laughs> well, here's one thing I can guarantee you. When the Miami Vice reboot happens, no amnesia story arc will ever happen. And that because amnesia is just not a thing, apparently, in modern TV. So let's go finish off the Miami Vice amnesia story arc. So when we open up where where we left off last week and in. in unbelievable on Miami Vice like we didn't magically skip ahead or do like a montage to cover what happened last week we literally picked up like at the moment that it left off last week including the guy standing outside of the watchtower and in case you forgot last week we ended with Miguel Oscar's son Manolo accidentally killing his dad then Miguel being killed by one of El Gato's men and now Sonny is in charge of the entire Manolo gang Everyone good? Cool. Yeah, yeah we're good. Let's do this. <laughs> yes. Tub. Pick up with Tubbs trying to get Sonny to remember before he shot him, you know, because, <laughs> I mean, that would be a bad memory to have is when he shot him. <laughs> we have the he same should moment. call him a chump. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same moment where Crockett says, yeah, you're Ricardo Tubbs, a cop. And then they wrestle for a moment. Tubbs takes off up the spiral staircase up to the top of the watchtower. Sonny can shoot Tubbs. Tubbs is not that fast up the stairs. <laughs> he can shoot him, but he decides the last minute <laughs> not <little> to. Slow. <laughs> when Tubbs gets up to the top, he's able to escape out a window. Crockett doesn't give chase, but Salazar, Commandante's men, give chase to Tubbs as he runs through Gator Country out in the back 40. I don't know which is more of a problem the gators that are out there or the men that are chasing you <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah i figured there's about a 50 50 shot that someone was getting eaten by a gator <laughs> surprisingly in my advice very few people get eaten by gators and it's actually kind of disappointing now that i think about <laughs> <It's> it disappointing <laughs> they're not very realistic for it being set in florida <laughs> no one's getting eaten by alligators so there hasn't been a single hurricane yeah what's with that <laughs> Tubbs finds a car, starts to hotwire it, but then someone else comes running up, so shooting at him, so he hides, and then he wrestles with that man. He gets him into the Jeep that he Let, was trying to hotwire. Let's clarify things. Hotwire is such a loose term. He opens up the hood and finds two loose wires and touches <laughs> them together, and lucky enough, it starts the Jeep. So, But before he can drive away, he's got to fight another guy off who wants the Jeep, obviously. I mean... <laughs> It's a nice it's a Jeep. Pretty, it's a pretty new Jeep. Yeah, it's I mean, only got a few bullet holes in it, yeah. so it's pretty pristine for Florida standards. So, and it ends with Salazar's guys wasting their own guy, <laughs> and then Tubbs shooting a few of Salazar's guys, and then taking off. I think Salazar is going to have to start hiring. Sonny walks up just in time to see Tubbs drive away too, and that's what I was talking about. Like you see the there's a little dip in height. In, yeah, it's like oh, he looks <laughs> really short right there. <laughs> And then we go to the opening credits. Now, before we get started, this is normally where we like to check in with the guest stars, but this week's a little different. Well, so all of our guest stars, except one, is from the previous episode. We already met Celeste and Cliff and everyone. We talked about them last episode. So I guess the only guest star we're left talking about is Morris the Panther. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite, actually. <laughs> The best one yes, of this episode. Yes, and most the Panther. He he didn't do much film work after this. Uh, he could be viewed at the Miami Dade Zoo for a short period in the eighties, and we assume that he is dead uh, because I don't know how long jaguars live. So Morris, if still alive, uh, us give us up. a shout. We love an interview. <laughs> I'm lying. That couldn't find any info on Morris. They could have. <laughs> It up. <laughs> Makes like a whole backstory for him. He got into acting when he was a, a young cub. <laughs> yep, yep. Couldn't find anything. No one knows what happened to Morris. Morris the Panther is gone forever. You see, Morris the Panther lives in some magical place with Tubbs Jr. <laughs> so when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct. They can't identify the person that Tubbs like 
got killed and escorted around the town in the stolen Jeep. And he took him back to the precinct. They can't identify who that guy is. Tubbs, Stan, and Castillo are talking. And Tubbs says he doesn't know if he can get through to Sonny. He, he thought for a second he might have. And Stan asks if Sonny's been turned. And I just gotta say, Stan's hair is a miracle. Also, he looks... I didn't realize it until later in the episode when someone asked him like have you lost weight he really did he did lose weight it's yeah. not just his hair we're gonna bring that up later. oh yeah no, no. <laughs> gotta go back to that but <laughs> <laughs> he looks like mark mcguire just saying <laughs> i'd say more like mark's brother dan but okay <laughs> did everyone else notice there was no trudy that... in this episode <gasps> i didn't even think about that there was a gina she was in the episode she was in the episode but didn't talk yeah, no Trudy at all. Trudy at all. Trudy. Wow. <laughs> Trudy. <laughs> hey, by the way, Alexis and Olivia, listen out there. We would love to interview you. <laughs> yeah, Trudy. <laughs> Olivia, Olivia Brown, <laughs> we would love to do an interview with you before this show is over. And just remember, like, we're so Trudy. shocked that you wouldn't even appear in this episode. <laughs> we love to rectify that. You know, give a shout out. We'd love to do an interview <laughs> on the show with you. Hey, I, we stand by it the entire run. The best police officer is Trudy. Of course. And the person who's going to come out of the at the end of the show the least scathed is Trudy. Trudy. <laughs> <laughs> out at the Sunny compound, Sunny gives Celeste a fancy necklace. Ugh. And then he shows her her, her other gift. Falling. <laughs> <laughs> and you see that she's got a panther for her, too, that has a matching necklace. They could go palling around together. That's animal cruelty, making that poor panther wear that stupid necklace. <laughs> <laughs> or Jaguar. I'm sorry. Yeah, what? His name is Morse, by the way. <laughs> Morse. <'Cause laughs> he, he has a name. <laughs> so he starts having flashbacks, including one of Caitlin. And his panther. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <And> Morse. <laughs> <laughs> and he storms off. You know, in, in this first scene, he's kissing his new girl. And he's thinking of and he flashes and thinks about Caitlyn. And in my head, I was wondering who you think he thinks is better, the new girl or the old girl, Celeste versus Caitlyn. And in between there, Julia Roberts. You no, know, he's let one get away there. Yeah, I mean, let that one get away from. The, uh. <laughs> now we have a gangster montage, which is my favorite montage type. <laughs> of all the montages. Uh, is the murdering montages. <laughs> Those are my favorite ones. Sonny has really gone off the deep end. They show him holding up a gang who's doing an airdrop, and they're going to take their drugs. They show Cliff shooting a Stinger missile at a boat and blowing it up. And then he has a flashback of when the original Ferrari got blown up, mm -hmm. too. And then we end with where Cliff has more gang members from Elgato. Two of them are lynched. Another one's hung upside down. He's, like, cutting them with a knife. And this one you see, actually, I started to realize, like, Cliff is actually doing most of the killing. It's not Sonny. He's not doing it. He's just like ordering it or whatever, but he's not actually doing it. Even in this scene, you kind of get Sonny's got that like Napoleon theory of that every one of the guys can be flipped and turned into uh, employees. And Cliff is pretty adamant that their path is to get to Elgato and then end him. And that's what all of this gangster stuff has been for. It's been ruining their drug trade. So they're taking over for Combinante, and then they're also blowing up and killing everyone that's associated with Elgato, which is ruining him, which is where we get to the next scene at Elgato. So now, just real fast, like you mentioned, John, Sonny thinks that all of them can be flipped, and he has to pull a gun on Cliff, and Cliff finally concedes when he gets the gun pulled on him. Because, you know, bitch needs to get back in line. Uh, <laughs> Burnett is the captain or the head of the cartel i mean cliff's gotta know his place <laughs> so when we get to elgato's just an aside here elgato is the best dressed villain that's ever been on miami vice <laughs> <laughs> um if he's like a cross between liberace and a pimp i don't know <laughs> in this scene at his house he's wearing a copper colored muumuu -moo. Mm -hmm. with a straw hat and driving gloves, and then he shoots up his own place, saying that you have not heard the last of Elgato. Dude, Elgato is such a drama queen, and what I've realized now, uh, between this last episode and this episode, is that Elgato is pretty useless to the story. In fact, most of his scenes are him shooting up his own shit. <laughs> <laughs> and being very, very sweaty. Yeah, uh, like he just got out of a pool. <laughs> 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 Even Tubbs is like, hey, man, you look a little warm. <laughs> yeah, you're glistening a little too much there. 
At the waterfront, Cliff is meeting up with Commandante Salazar, telling him that Sonny's lost it. He's, you know, becoming a Coke Nazi. And he's just dipping into the supply now. He's living the high life. He is not connected with what's happening on the streets. And Commandante says, though, I appreciate what he's been doing about Elgato. And Cliff says, it's been me that's been doing it. Sonny's actually out on a snowboat somewhere. It's I'm the one that's actually taking care of Elgato. Salazar says, okay, like, I guess you got to do what you got to do. Whatever. See you later. Yeah, Cliff is pretty slimy. And, you know, I mean, even Salazar, he, he kind of treats him like he's Burnett's sidekick because he kind of is Burnett's sidekick. But you see Cliff is like trying hard to to step out of that sidekick role. This meeting was specifically set up to go around Sonny. Yeah, and he also lied about stuff and said that his it was him who did the routes and it was his idea and all that stuff. Like, no, actually, it was Sonny that did that part. <laughs> Where is Sonny? Feels like <laughs> he's been he's kind of missing. Is he getting drunk somewhere? <laughs> well, out of the Sunny compound, which used to be the Menola compound, but it's the Sunny compound now. He's got two of those electric ball things, like where you put your hands I on them. I always wanted those when I was a kid. I wanted one of those so bad, my parents wouldn't buy me one. <laughs> I hope you're listening. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> and Sonny is getting D-R-U-N-K drunk. He's like sitting on that couch like, I don't need a label. I got my pack. Morris, where's Morris? <laughs> yeah, he's like liquid. His body's like liquid laying there. Like. <laughs> on a side note, do you think he named him Morris after Morris Day in the time? <laughs> He's having more flashbacks to Tubbs. He's like, man, we did do some cool shit together. <laughs> Played sad music on the jukebox. Celeste comes in. He sees that Sunny is just a mess. And he calls her Katie. Dun, dun, dun. And she's like, who's Katie? <laughs> <laughs> he, stiffs arms, he stiff arms her. <laughs> Get off me, bitch. And then runs <laughs> off. She gets real mad. <laughs> Sorry, but that was my favorite part of the episode. He's like, who the f*** are you? Get out of here. Pushes her out of the way. The next day, Celeste goes, was supposed to be a meeting with Sonny and Cliff, but only Cliff is there. And Cliff says that he's probably out getting drunk or something. So Celeste sits down for a few minutes. He tr she tries to leave. But Cliff grabs her and then tells her the story about his favorite cow that okay. <laughs> died and then the farmer died because he didn't get another cow I, I don't okay was she the cow or was she the <laughs> farmer in that story because yeah he starts with this and i'm like okay so she's a cow yeah okay wait a minute too. she's a dry cow like wait a minute is the moral that she becomes a ribeye like like where's he going with this and then he starts bringing up a new cow you know and there's like uh, oh oh he wants her to help him kill burnett like why don't you just start there, man? <laughs> <laughs> I think he's all roundabout way. He's saying Sonny is the cow that's dried up and you're going to be the farmer mm -hmm. who dies because you're not willing to go get a new cow. Now, all you need to do is get a new cow for milk. Which is very yeah, dramatic. But, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Does, do farmers really die when they're as best far cow as leaves? cows go? Uh, I mean, as far as cows go, I, I don't really think Cliff is that much better. Um, I mean, he's no, uh, what, El Gigante or Gordo? <laughs> I didn't get it at first either. And then later I see that he's supposed to be like a hick and because he wears those polo yeah. ties. And then also he's got a friend that works in the gang with him named Cletus. Like, oh, okay, that all makes sense. <laughs> Out at so the he's water attracted to cats. <laughs> <laughs> and at the waterfront, Sonny's having one of them thinking time walks. You know. He's just strolling along the water. Remember when me and Tubbs played shirtless volleyball? <laughs> oh, wait, that didn't happen. <laughs> he has a vision of himself getting shot. Then he also has a vision of when Evan was dying. So now he's even more confused, kind of just pacing around by the waterfront. So then we go to the gym. At the gym, it's that night. Sonny's watching a couple of the spiders train because apparently Burnett Enterprises is mixed up into kind of a little bit of everything. Apparently. And no one will well, recognize dude, him in the boxing circuit in Miami. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I, I was going to say. It's like, I think that somewhere deep down inside, Sonny really wanted to be a boxing promoter because Happy Chance, good old Burnett, also wants to get into boxing and promote guys. I mean, if there was some reason why the vice team might be involved in the South Beach boxing scene, I can't remember what it is. There's some link, like something about a sports network and then uh -huh. a trainer. Someone I, dying, I, I you know. I can't, <laughs> not coming back to me. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. Never mind. No one will ever remember him. It's good. 
<laughs> so he's watching a couple of fighters with Celeste and his bodyguards. They go to leave, and Celeste says, hey, I forgot my purse. I'll be right back. And, she, and so he goes, fine, okay, I'll meet, I'll meet you at the limo. He goes walking out. Celeste is just hiding inside because she knows what's going to happen. As Sunny gets closer, Celeste can't take it anymore, comes running out, just yells to Sunny, who then sees that the door is open to the limo. A man that's not Sunny, but is supposed <laughs> to be Sunny, turns and runs as the car explodes, sending him airborne. Celeste comes to him, and we go to commercial. I think it was a delayed explosion. Those those slow bombs. You know, <laughs> they have plenty of time to jump out of the way. Um, so, but, I mean, now what does Celeste have? Now she has a, a blowed up dry cow? <laughs> like... Well, Melissa, and you brought this up while we were watching it. There's only one way to cure amnesia. You have to get it. However you got it, you have to do that self that to yourself again, right? Yes. So and all the and all my expert TV watching, when Stephanie got <laughs> amnesia in full house, it was because she got hit in the head with something. So they dropped something else on her head again, and then she remembered all of a sudden. <laughs> so that's what happened. He got He got it from an explosion. What's going to happen when he has an explosion? He's going to wake up and be like, I am Sonny Crockett. <laughs> Who are you? Now, using that same theory, does that mean if we blow him up again, we'll get Eve Burnett back? Yep. There's always a chance. It's lurking in there. This is scientific, people. I've done the research, okay? <laughs> Years of TV watching has told me that I'm going to get amnesia one day. It's because I got hit in the head. <laughs> and you have to hit me in the head again. So I got to do the exact same thing. However, you got yes. to fall down the stairs. If a yep. grandfather <laughs> talk fell on yes, you, like exactly. whatever it is, like, yep. got to do that exact same thing. Not, got yep. it. Got it. Yep. Okay. So now we know. <laughs> <laughs> we have a really fast scene where Cliff is meeting with Salazar and he says to the Comandante, Cliff is. Oh, uh, sorry. The Sunny is dead, but the commandante is like, okay, whatever. We're still flying jugs in, right? Like, <laughs> isn't that the deal? <laughs> At the hospital, Sunny is in really bad shape. They're taking bandages off his face. Well, it turns out, sorry, his beautiful face is just fine. It's just his eyeballs. It's just, it's just his eyeballs. <laughs> no, no. It's so. Go- oh my god, he's so disfigured. Did you see how ugly he was? Is he going to be this way for the rest of the series? <laughs> he's not at a hospital though Mm-mm. he's somewhere else like she wouldn't got a doctor celeste wouldn't found a doctor coming out of the emergency room <laughs> kidnapped him <laughs> well, no, she see, paid him some money to bring him somewhere else <laughs> he see bang she quickly got him to a dermatologist that way <laughs> the explosion didn't do any damage he's perfectly fine <laughs> good thing he's got temporary blindness because that'll help string this scene out a little bit while his vision slowly comes back <laughs> he's in a bad shape though he's really stiff he's really sore he doesn't really remember what happened it starts to slowly come to him first he asks if Tubbs is l- looking for him and she's like who the hell is Tubbs yeah. and then he goes over and he looks in the mirror and he sees Celeste and he turns and yells at her now it must have been Algato that's who it was but then he slowly starts going through all the moments that happened right before the explosion members start going back for her purse like all of a sudden he's like it was you yeah. You were the one that said all this yes. stuff. And, and, and dur- literally during the scene, I am like, there you go. You're working it out. You figured it out. There you go, evil B. You work- there you go. There you go. Now shake the truth out of her. <laughs> he gets really mad at her. Really mad. And he has to control himself. And then she's like, I'm so sorry. He raised up like he's, he's going to shoot her. He's got his gun out, got yeah. it in her chest. And he raised up like he's going to shoot her. And this is what you were talking about, John. Burnett is the evilest, most badass mofo that's ever existed in South Beach. But that damn explosion <laughs> woke Crockett up in there. <laughs> and oh, sissy doesn't shoot her. And now, now Celeste knows that he's weak and he won't do it. <laughs> that's why she's like crying like a baby with a pillow over her face. And everything. He goes back to the mirror and has some more flashbacks, still in shock. Looking at himself in the mirror, Sorry. he can't figure out. He what goes back to the on. mirror and says, I'm gonna go have some more flashbacks. Let me look in this mirror. <laughs> out at Elgato's, even see, even Elgato's henchmen look fabulous. Like they, all of them are amazing. Nipple showing. My favorite <laughs> gang of all of Miami Vice. They all look amazing. He sees that Elgato's got a gun. He's outside, just drenched in sweat, and but Elgato saying, "Look at me, I'm ruined. I'm living in this puke hole. Like they've destroyed me." And he said in the previous scene where we saw Agato, he, he, he says that he 
couldn't get loans anymore. He was coming out of pocket to buy all the drugs. And then Burnett was stealing all the drugs from him or blowing it up or whatever. So he's ruined. He's done. And Pedro, poor Pedro, is saying, no, I got it. You're good. You're the best. You can get back from this. And I got goes, yeah, you know, you're right. Shoots Pedro. And then says, Pedro, you have not died in vain. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the scene would have been so much more dramatic. Pedro hadn't forgot the orange peels. This is. <laughs> He's going to take Pedro's this strength. This is clearly his godfather scene. <laughs> so now we go to Sonny. He's out walking, thinking. It looks like he's lost, actually, kind of walking around Miami. Lots of stuff looks familiar. He, he's walking around. He keeps, like, looking over his shoulder and stuff. And I think he's starting to get insecure about people staring at his man bun. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll say you were saying earlier, like, hey, that's where Tubbs and Crockett used to yep. play shirtless football. <laughs> exactly. And where you grifted the old men at for dominoes. <laughs> yeah. That's where I used to drink my little my Cuban oh. drinks and play dominoes with the old guys. See? And Sonny just keeps walking. And then he just walks right into the precinct like he had been retired. And he was like going back for old times. He walked in, sees his locker, walks right into the main area of the precinct, walks up to his desk and smiles at his desk. And everyone else is just like, oh, my God, this will just walk in here. I love that even the old lady who do, does the filing, she had a gun on him, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just kind of walks in like, hey, guys, uh, am I a criminal or uh, one of your co-workers? Like, anyone? <laughs> Someone please explode me again. <laughs> but, by My the way, based what's in this locker, I think this Crockett guy's a real loser. <laughs> So now he's been, I mean, he's turned himself in, essentially. He's in talking to Stan and Castillo. Castillo is not happy. Well, when is dad really so happy? I, I, mean. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really want to rush this this scene because I feel like it's pretty important because you, you see that Crockett, even though he's starting to remember who he is, really has no concept of reality right now. He's like trying to explain to them that he understands that that things can't go back to the way they used to be and you know maybe they have to suspend a little bit before they give him his job back but he's going to help them get elgato and that's going to make up for all of the people that he killed and the fact that he's the head of a criminal organization bringing in quarter ton of coke soon and dad asked him like what about that coffee shot down at the pier and Sonny's like oh, i don't know what you talk about this dan says what about that time you shot tubs and then they just let him hang. Yeah, he's like, what do you mean by I shot what, you, is, what, what, ha- what happened? What He likes to let him hang for a long time. And then dad finally goes, oh, but he was wearing a vest. It's cool. <laughs> like, don't worry about it. Conveniently, though, Crockett's uh, answers are, I-, I-, I don't remember breaking any laws during my bout of amnesia. <laughs> they arrest him. Dad says, I don't care what you're saying. Like, I'm booking you. They take him over to a regular interrogation room. And that's when Tubbs comes in. And Tubbs says, fuck, man, you tried to kill me twice. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with you? Turn the cameras off. Someone give me a phone book. <laughs> <laughs> so he says all he remembers is the boat blowing up. And then now that's it. Like there's, there's a big gap. But can we talk about how he's not at all remorseful? Like, I mean, this would be the time to be like, I'm so sorry, Tubbs. I know that I tried to shoot you th- two times. <laughs> I did shoot you once and I tried to shoot you in it multiple times. But I mean, you could say you're sorry. Like, there was no I'm sorry about that at all. Yeah, he's not remorseful. In fact, he's in pretty good spirits being that he just found out that he had amnesia. He shot his partner and, and his wife is dead. Still dead. Yeah, that's true. He has like he has to learn that all over again. Also that he killed a cop. I know he was a crooked cop, but he was still a cop. I just realized that yeah, I mean, the amnesia storyline and no one ever says the word amnesia. No, uh, I don't think they do. That is weird. And at this point in the episode, since his walking montage, things like really slowed down in the episode. You know, we get this real slow, emotional back and forth between him and Tubbs. And he almost convinces Tubbs to let him, like, help them with the case, even though he's facing, like, 12 murder counts. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs says, at first, no. And then he says, I'll sleep on it. Sonny says, you can't sleep on it. Tonight, or very, very soon, there's going to be a big coke deal, and lots of coke's going to hit the street. Tub says, whatever, man. Stan, can you please take him down, I guess, to jail? Like, that's that. That's what they're going to take Why him. make Stan do it, though? Why can't Tubbs do it? That bugged me. <laughs> like, poor Stan has to be the one to take him. He's like, I don't even want to be involved in this. Like, I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> and poor Stan. 
we all saw what was happening. We all knew what was coming. <laughs> Stan walks him to the elevator, and the whole time Crockett's making nice, and he's complimenting Stan, so you know that this is going to end with him hitting Stan in the back of the head with something. I was going to say, you knew right away when he asked how Stan was, because he never <laughs> cares about Stan at all. So he's like, how are you been doing? Yeah, like, pretty good. Yeah, it was like, been okay. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I was like, oh, poor Stan. He's about to get bumped in the head, isn't he? <laughs> I got two things that I want to end this scene on. <laughs> Yes, there's all this stuff with Stan. So first of all, he insults Stan by saying he looks like he lost weight. You used to be fat before, but you're looking a lot better. I remember that much. And then I'm going to punch you in the back of the head and hit every button on the elevator. <laughs> when you're stuck in there's here. that. There's also more, though. <laughs> but that's not the main point I want to mention here. As Stan and Sonny are walking down the hall, Sonny says hi to Bob. <laughs> who's a police officer escorting a criminal down the hallway and bob says i never thought they turn you it's so it's so i'm like thanks bro and then they start leaving and then bob starts telling the criminal that he's walking with that used to be the best cop in the force i never thought he'd be turned and the criminal's like oh that's good information to know <laughs> <laughs> what the hell bob yeah. what the hell bob <laughs> so, what the hell <laughs> yeah, it, I, I'm here. So that caught my attention too because it was like, really, Crockett was the last one you thought would be uh, <laughs> the the last one you thought they would arrest. Really, <laughs> one that goes rogue and shoots people. And okay, now Sonny has escaped. He's back on the Miami streets. According to Vice, he is still a turned dirty cop, former cop who's wanted for murder. <laughs> Just throw that in there. <laughs> At a Cliff's compound, not Sonny's compound anymore. It's Cliff's compound. He's on the phone trying to find someone to help launder some cash. And Sonny comes walking in and Cliff immediately panics. And he's like climbs on his hands and knees out from behind <laughs> the table and starts putting money back into the safe. He's like, oh, man, it's really bad that like Elgato like tried to kill you. Oh, boy, am I happy to see you. <laughs> hey, pal. Uh -huh. <laughs> see, and this is where you knew that he's still Crockett. He's not. Evil B is gone. Evil Burnett is gone forever. Because Evil Burnett would have cut Cliff's head off in this scene if he was still who he was. Back at the precinct, Dad is talking to Tubbs. They can't find Sonny. He's just missing. He might be at, you know, the house that he's going to stay in at, but it's cool. Tubbs says he thought that he was, that Sonny was talking straight to him, but now it's like, for sure, he's turned. He's evil. We have to take Sonny down. And then also they found that the man that was killed and escorted back by Tubbs is one of Salazar's men. Just to close that loop. At a diner, Cliff and Sonny are talking. Cliff finally gets the info to Sonny that they're going to have this 500-pound deal happening at the waterfront at an old water factory after some beating around the bush. After hearing this, Sonny gets up and goes to the bathroom. Cliff has one of the bodyguards follow Sonny over to the bathroom and wait outside the door. Sonny uses the opportunity in the bathroom to climb out the window, go make a phone call, comes back in the window, comes out of the bathroom, sees that there's a bodyguard there. Then he runs the bodyguard over and throws him across the table and turns to Cliff and says, some trust you got with your partner, huh? So now we're at the water plant. This is where that deal is going to go down. The drugs are coming in. They're bringing men on trucks that they said in the last episode that they put the drugs inside of the trucks that are delivering food. That way they wouldn't be stopped at the border. And then in there is the drugs. They show up the crates of veggies with the drugs hidden inside of them. Sonny's overseeing the deal. And the man that Bob was hauling away turns to Cliff and says, you got to get some better security around here. That man's heat. Bob. Bob. <laughs> Bob. You got blood on your hands now, bro. <laughs> Like, what the fuck, man? You ruined this entire thing. You that, almost got Sonny murdered before the police could show up. That, that is not... I, I admit, Bob did screw up. But <laughs> in five seasons, in five seasons, this is the first time a criminal recognizes Sonny during a drug deal. True story. <laughs> like, seriously? And, and, this is also... The first time he has not been an undercover cop because he's murdered like 30 people in the time <laughs> that he's known all of these criminals. So, like, he is at this point in time, he's the least likely to be a cop amongst the group. <laughs> Way to fucking go, Bob. Bob, we got to talk. It's okay? all Bob's fault. When your review comes up, we got to talk, man. <laughs> a man grabs Sonny. Cliff kicks him right in the jimmy, too. He says, Cletus, get me some rope. <laughs> And they're going to lynch Sonny right there. And right when they're about to do it, Metro Dade helicopter comes flying in because obviously we knew what Sonny was calling in. So he was calling the precinct to tell them that 
this is where the deal was going to go down. Everyone scrambles, but the whole area is surrounded, so no one's able to get away. Tub catches up to Cliff, and they start wrestling around, and Cliff is able to throw Tubbs over and who's now hanging from a ledge on like a catwalk in between two water towers. He's about to shoot Tubbs and Sunny comes running over and shoots and kills Cliff and then pulls Tubbs back up onto the catwalk. And we're best By friends the way, again. <laughs> he killed two people in that exchange. So if you're keeping count, we're up to 32 uh, on the body <laughs> count. Tubbs says thanks and then Sunny says, I gotta run, man. I got something else I have to handle before the heat gets there. So he's going to try and go talk to Celeste and get her to leave. But thankfully, because we haven't ended all of the story arcs in this yet. So it gives us an opportunity to close out the Elgato storyline. You go out to the yeah, compound. So, which I guess it's Celeste's compound now. It's not I don't know. It's no one now. <laughs> it, it's almost like he went downstairs of the drug bust and was somehow back in the compound, <laughs> um, which is really weird. But yeah, he pretty much he, like he walks in and Celeste is packing some dresses. You know, she's, she's going to take the nice shit that he's bought her with her. <laughs> Obviously, because uh, things are kind of blowing up at the old uh, uh, Burnett compound. <laughs> so as she's packing her, her stuff, comes in with the like, hey, you know, so you're homeless now. Uh, can I call you sometime? <laughs> he specifically says, you don't have to leave. And then she says, what am I going to say with you? And he never answers that He's question. Like, no, no, you can't say it with me. <laughs> but you can do it yourself. Yes. You can, you're an independent woman. You can figure it, it out. <laughs> actually makes the comment, are you going to take care of me? And he has the kind of the reaction like, oh, not on a cop salary. <laughs> not mentioning the fact that he is rich, by the way. He, he inherited a crap load of money when that um, Cheryl... Um, Catherine? Uh, Carol. Ca yeah. Caroline. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the first one. So when they're kissing, <laughs> Elgato comes in looking amazing, okay? Just zebra print jacket with no shirt on underneath. He just looks fabulous. He's got a great gun, too, like a real shiny, big handgun, too. Elgato is now poor, broke. Everything's lost for him now. And then, and now the Manolo gang is basically done, too. Except for Salazar. He's still out there. By the way, that storyline's never going to come to an end. He, like, he's just kind of out there. Elgato makes them go downstairs. He says, I want to know where the safe is. Celeste and Sonny go, there's no safe, bro. I don't know what you're talking about. But they keep looking off to the left at, the, at a door. Now, the debate is, like, were they doing that on purpose? Or were they, like, trying kind of hint to him to go do that? Or were they just, like, remembering, like, oh, yeah, there's that door? kind of feels like it was a setup, right? That they... I think it's a setup, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, they had the gun on him, and I think their best option was to get him to open more because maybe the zebra, zebra print would <laughs> convince whatever wild animal was behind the door and it's i'll give you a hint it's not elvis the gator we don't know what <laughs> elvis is probably shoes at this point but if only he had another exotic pet elgato goes over the door says oh the safe must be in here because you know you just open the closet door for it's safe, safe. <laughs> and it's safe. he opens up the door and morris comes jumping out and tackles elgato and then we go to the end of the episode Question, how does Sonny and Celeste make it out with Morris <laughs> in a feeding frenzy? I, so, obviously, you can't condemn Morris for attacking Elgato. One, his parents were in trouble. Like most <laughs> pets respond, they defend their parents. And two, he was asking for it. He was wearing a zebra print jacket. <laughs> Zebras are panther food. He thought he was a steak. I don't think that Morris is nearly as dangerous as he's led to, as we're led to believe. I, I just hope he found a good home because now, I mean, does Celeste keep Morris? Uh, now that Celeste and Burnett are breaking up, like who gets <laughs> who's Morris in the divorce? <laughs> My question is on the last point that I have on this episode. It's his name is Algado. He gets attacked by a cat, so the cat killed the cat. Yeah. Was this joke planned from the beginning? Were they sitting on this crap <laughs> joke for three episodes to have a cat kill the cat? Well, I ask you, Dom, was there any other purpose for Elgato's character other than... Because obviously, as I stated earlier, 
all of the scenes with Elgato is pretty much him throwing a temper tantrum and shooting up his own stuff. <laughs> On Sunny's side, the only time we see Elgato is when they're, you know, that quick scene when he blows up one of his boat or when he's got his men hanging up and down. So it didn't have to be Elgato. It could have been any drug gang. Yeah, so they could have been going up. Ex- it really feel it really feels like that Morris and Elgato were specifically set up for this one joke that we weave them into all of these other episodes just to set up so the cat can kill the cat. I think so. <laughs> <laughs> Why else would he bring her a wild cat as a pet? <laughs> and that's the end of the episode. And that is the end of the Sunny Amnesia arc. I have many thoughts about how this episode ended and how we got to the end of this arc and i have many concerns about what's going to happen in season five because there's a lot of questions that didn't get answered in this episode that was really hoping for that got talked about in this episode but before we do that let's go talk about this week's music there's one name in music that might sound familiar maybe let's go see what that band is let's go talk about this week's music all right john this week's music is I guess not surprising. And then also to, um, to learn that one of the songs in this will get used repeatedly in season five. So I don't know how to feel about that right now. This is a good introduction to season five's music because things have kind of changed. And one of the things, let's talk about the familiar name in the music. We have Don't Give Up by Peter Gabriel and Kate Bush. Obviously, we've talked about Peter Gabriel. This is Peter Gabriel. Seventh song in the series, <laughs> the most songs by any solo artist in the entire series. By the way, it is also one of five of the song of his seven songs in the series off the album So. Oh, so wow. someone really liked the album So. So clearly someone on staff really liked the album So more than anything. By the way, Kate Bush also uh, appeared in our music way back in the hello uh, with hello earth in the episode bushido mm. since we have talked about both the artists we will kind of skip going over their biographies for you and instead we will say adieu to peter gabriel because this will be his final appearance the last time i plan on talking about Peter Gabriel, so, um, <laughs> and his albums. Our next song is You'll Never Listen to Me by Peter Cetera. Peter Cetera, most notable for being the lead singer and bassist of the band Chicago. Maybe my least favorite thing that has the word Chicago in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, he was an original member of the band from 1967 to 1985. From 85 until, well, now, uh, he's had a pretty successful solo career as, as as well. Believe it or not, guys, he was a part between 67 and 85 of 17 Chicago albums. Holy crap. Those guys have way too much time yes. on their hands. And then after 17 albums with Chicago, he released eight solo records as well. So uh, he's been busy. Wow. He was born and raised in Southside Chicago. So I guess the name of the band kind of fits there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so he actually went to a seminary school in high school because his mom wanted him to be a priest. But that didn't actually work out. He got into music. His parents, instead of buying him a guitar, bought him an accordion, which I got a good <laughs> chuckle at. Hold on. Hold on. I just thought of the best thing ever as a parent. If you really want to troll your child. <laughs> I get an accordion, yeah. <laughs> you buy him an accordion. I heard you like this. Yeah. Hey, Mom, Dad, I want to... Can, can you guys give me a guitar? Sure. Here's an accordion. <laughs> also... It's probably the evilest gift to give to a to someone who has kids. Like I bought your kid an accordion. <laughs> yeah, we're looking at you, John. Yes. Don't buy any accordions. <laughs> you get a kid an accordion. <laughs> at the age of fifteen, a trip to a club with some friends would inspire him to go out and buy his own acoustic guitar at the good old Montgomery Wards. <laughs> He'd eventually be led to play bass, and by the end of high school, he would play for a rather popular regional band called The Exceptions. He even <laughs> joked that at the time he was making more money than his dad playing music. Sub now accordion. <laughs> 
The Exceptions would release several singles and ultimately one five-song EP entitled Rock and Roll Mass. But in December 1967, he would show up early to one of his shows so that he could watch a band called The Big Thing perform. Enjoy it. In fact, he would be inspired by their use of the horn section in combination with their rock and roll sound. And he would leave The uh, Exceptions and join the big thing. Wow, you can just do that. Be like, I'm joining you guys. <laughs> Came to see one yeah. of your shows. Now I'm here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Only would he join, but he would help them ch- change their name. I-, I emphasize help them change <laughs> their name to Chicago Transit Authority. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Which would I'm later start- be shortened to Chicago. I'm starting a band named Bart. <laughs> <laughs> so if you thought they were named after the city of Chicago, you're wrong. They're actually named after the Transportation Authority. Satara actually started out with the band sharing vocals with Robert Lamb and Terry Kath. But by the second album, he'd make his presence known with the song 25 or 6 to 4 which would be their first major hit with Satara on vocals. He would enter the 70s. He would become a more prolific songwriter, leading to the height of their popularity in 1976 when he would write and sing If You Leave Me Now. It it would be their first number one single, and that would appear on the 10th album. By 1981, the popularity of disco would cause Chicago's popularity to drop, and Satara would try his first solo album, called Peter Cetera, and it would be kind of, a, well, a commercial failure. So he would run back to Chicago. In 82, Chicago would release Chicago 16, because after, you know, 16 albums, you just start to number them rather than name them. <laughs> Their song, Hard to Say I'm Sorry, would go number one and help boost them back into popularity. It would also be featured in the movie Summer Lovers, starring Daryl Hannah. And it would hang around with Chicago until 84, when they would release Chicago's Chicago 17 album. See? It started number. <laughs> it makes sense now. With the popularity of Chicago 17, which had multiple hits on it, he would once again try and go solo. And this time in 85, he would leave the band and actually be successful going solo. And most successful solo songs is Glory of Love, which is the theme to Karate Kid 2. The best Karate Kid. Yes, it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, was, he would see continued success through the 80s and 90s as a solo artist, even wrote, even co-wrote the Baywatch theme. And he still performs and records today. He even has his own label, and he lives in Idaho for some strange reason. <laughs> Stuff I know. <laughs> you heard it. You heard us. <laughs> yeah. Come on. So, and that leads us to our final song, Everything Inside of Me by Tim Truman. So we talked about a little bit of season four, but season four was the last season for Jan Hammer. Jan Hammer would leave the show, and so Tim Truman actually would take over for Jan Hammer in season five. Tim Truman would get the job after composing uh, the score for Michael Mann's TV movie, L.A. Takedown, which is what the inspiration for the movie Heat was. If working with Michael Mann wasn't enough, he would also be recommended by his good friend Don Johnson. (laughs) Oh, there we go. So I mentioned, you know, maybe Michael Mann hiring his buddies back. Just bringing them all on. Come on, guys. It's it's season five. (laughs) This is all we're doing. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah, he would take over uh, composing for the show, and actually, in this episode, he had originally chosen a John Cougar Mellencamp song, you know, Cougar, the Cat, <laughs> El Gato, Morris the Panther, <laughs> guys starting to see, see, this guy's witty. He thinks about this stuff. (laughs) But unfortunately, the show could not secure the rights to it in time. And so he would quickly record everything inside of me, including singing the lyrics. Not only did he write it, but he also performed and recorded it. And it got such good reception that the show turned around and asked him to write two more songs later on in season five. So we will talk about Tim Truman again. I have no idea what I will say. (laughs) <laughs> I read something very interesting about the use of Tim Truman that it was a sign of their music budget because he was doing kind of mock songs. They were like covers 
of other people's songs, but with the lyrics slightly changed or the tune slightly changed so that they couldn't pay for the correct song. So they had Tim Truman make a similar version. It's like the Dollar Tree knockoff version of (laughs) (laughs) the song that they wanted. It's a generic. (laughs) So basically, Jan Hammer had his own style. And when Tim Truman came in, he didn't want to just start redoing. He didn't want to follow up Jan Hammer trying to impersonate him. And the showrunners did use it kind of their leverage. Tim Truman was composing mostly a rap, a rock and roll soundtrack for the show. And a lot of people attributed it as a way for them to use, to spend less money on popular music, but still have the rock and roll background uh, in between shots and scenes. So whereas, you know, you had the Crockett theme and the Tubbs theme and stuff from Jan Hammer. What we got from Tim Truman, aside from writing three songs on the, of his own in the music, was that he also did, uh, like, he would compose, like, rock songs for scenes that sounded like popular music at the time. Pretty sneaky, sis. <laughs> Pretty sneaky. He would, after Vice, he would still do some, uh, he would do, I would say this, when he left Vice, he he's known for a couple big things that he did composing-wise, but in between those big things... He did a crap ton of scores for TV movies. TV movies like Knight Rider 2010. (laughs) And Martial Law starring Jimmy Smith. I know that name. (gasps) I want to watch that now. I don't know what that is, but I want to see it. (laughs) Hey, how come Jimmy Smith had to die in an explosion? How come he couldn't just get amnesia? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe he's not Uh, dead. (laughs) (laughs) He's just... He's just got amnesia, and he's, for some reason, doing martial law. He's solving crimes in New York City with another partner that'll turn his back on him, and then he'll die of cancer. Hey, stop it. <laughs> he doesn't die of cancer, he dies of a heart condition. An actual movie movie that he would do the score for was Oliver Stone's South Central, but... Getting back to the TV show side, he would also compose the main title theme for Melrose Place and score over 120 episodes. You're welcome. <laughs> well, John, I was I saw the people who were on the list for the music and I was like, Tim Truman, that's who I'm ready for. Tim, I, Peter Zotera, whatever. Peter Gabriel, get off me, bitch. <laughs> Tim Truman, what's up? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. And Melrose Place is not the only place that he would continue to see success. He would score 35 episodes of the Showtime series Jeremiah. He would also win win an Emmy as a co-producer for something called The Killer Whale People. (laughs) And he also scored the entire first season of the show Charmed. Well, that's amazing. Okay, maybe they weren't all successful. (laughs) Currently, he is directing a project. He wrote himself a sci-fi film called Time. Call, which the last we checked, is preparing to start filming to 2018. So keep your eyes peeled for Time Call. Netflix will pretty much commission anything, which is why we're missing an opportunity not to submit a script. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Time Call will have Jimmy Smith. I don't know. <laughs> a movie called Time Call? That's got JCVD all over it. Okay, that's even better. Oh, yeah. Can <laughs> so we get Jimmy and JCVD in one movie together? I don't know. I can't handle that. Never mind. <laughs> that's too much. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. Not just this episode, but the amnesia arc in general. Because we reached the end. We have badass Burnett. He's back to being middle of the road Crockett. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. All right, Melissa. You are our resident Miami Vice expert. You knew what was going to happen with the Amnesia storyline. I'm clearing the deck here. All right, people, listen up. We're we're clearing the deck. We only have a handful of times in all of Miami Vice where Melissa needs an opportunity to get something off her (laughs) chest that she's been holding (laughs) for 30 years. Melissa, what are your final thoughts on this episode? I'm very disappointed in this episode. It started out so well like i love i mean absolutely love the amnesia storyline and i feel like this was like they were so good they were so good and they dropped the ball at the very end (laughs) (laughs) they were gonna get that touchdown but they didn't do it (laughs) i feel like it was a cop-out i'm sorry but if crockett was is supposed to be such a good friend to everybody i'd feel like once he found out he tried to murder (laughs) tubs he would be a little bit more upset 
he didn't even seem upset that he murdered people. Like when they tell him that he murdered a cop, he's like, oh, I don't remember doing that. <laughs> What were you supposed to Bob? Mm-hmm. Fuck Bob. Yeah, okay, yeah, Bob, yeah. <laughs> also, this this episode is a highlight to that Crockett's just not a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> he comes in there, he's like, hey, by the way, I'm back. Sorry, I murdered a bunch of people. You know, hey, what can you do? I had amnesia. Like, I just forgot who I was. Yeah. He finally yeah. decides yeah. to ask. Sorry, Stan I shot to... tubs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He finally or decides punch to... Stan in the back of the head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Finally to decides to pay attention to Stan and ask him how he is. And it's only because he's had amnesia for like a year. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, we don't because... know. Maybe Stan lost all that weight because something's wrong with him. <laughs> You leave Stan alone. Coming soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm disappointed in the ending. I love the storyline. I love I love evil Burnett. I love the amnesia storyline because I'm a sucker for, like, the drama of 80s TV. And <laughs> that just falls perfect. But I'm definitely disappointed that they decided to be like, okay, let's just wrap it up in a nice little bow. But I will say, for, for before you guys give your final thoughts, I will say this. This is not going to be like when Crockett got shot for Bullet for Crockett, where you're like, he got shot, but no one ever talks about it again. This is going to be a thing that will be weave, be weaving in the storylines for the rest of the, the season, is that he did this. He has, like, things he has to get over, you know. Things have to, like, he has to fix things. He's not going to just be let off because he had amnesia. Although that's a good defense, so. <laughs> <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? So, I'm a little sad to see Evil Burnett go. He was... My favorite version of uh, Sonny Burnett and of Son- Sonny Crockett, if I'm going to be honest. Uh, <laughs> Evil Burnett's my favorite of... I, I don't know. I mean, it was... I-, I felt like it was a good episode, but, it, you know, I'm with Melissa. Was, there were parts that were less satisfying. I-, I think for me, it made me ask questions about season five moving on. One, is Crockett just going to get away with being a murderer? It's, it seems like he should... Spend a little time in prison. I don't know. <laughs> How come Morris the Panther couldn't replace Elvis? I know we weren't <laughs> going to get Elvis back, but we have Morris the Panther. Did, did, did he continue to date Celeste a little <laughs> bit? Like, did they try and make things work after? Because I'm going to be honest. I think he likes Celeste better than, than Caitlyn or... <laughs> Oh, uh, you know, and he's got all that money in that big empty house. Like, I could totally see him hooking up with Celeste in there. Uh, <laughs> And in the explosion, did the man bun burn up in the explosion? Is that how he lost it? Is that like <laughs> when he got, or or is the man bun what turns him into uh, evil Burnett? And then when he lost the man bun, that's when the Crockett part of his brain kicked in. I know the answer to this. It must have burned up his hair tie, so he can't he can't put his hair in the bun anymore. Just like ev- evaporated his hair ties. He's got no he's got no scrunchie. <laughs> put his hair in that bun yeah uh, uh, uh. so and I, I i guess my last question are we gonna have to put up with this disfigured version of <laughs> crockett moving forward i mean that dermatologist that quack really messed him up and i don't know if i can take looking at him the rest of season five after that explosion well i'm gonna be a little more forgiving for this episode than you two although i am in agreement with you that it's disappointing when we get to the end of this episode but i'm gonna explain how i think they could have fixed that i think this is one episode short that they got this amnesia story arc done here and that this episode should have ended with the way that it did with Sonny killing Cliff, Celeste leaves. He has now retribution to pay to Miami Vice for his actions. And one of the ways that he's going to do that would be in the next episode, he helps Vice bring down Salazar and Elgato. But they didn't have another episode to do that. So they just let Salazar sail away. And then they did this really fast fix with Elgato to get him so that he's gone. In my opinion... This was great up until the last five minutes that they rushed to finish up all the storylines to get it done. And that's where it, it kind of fell down. And so that means that in between, they rushed 
when he first got back to Vice, when they interrogated him, when he escaped, they rushed all that stuff because they took so much setup time in the beginning of the episode, and then they still had to finish all the other storylines. If they would have left Elgato and Salazar for also, next week, that would have been better. I, I would have also been okay with it an episode like the trial of Sonny Burnett episode. He has to go to trial for, for being Sonny Burnett, and then like at the end of the episode, his lawyer gets him off because they can't prove that he murdered, you know, 32 two people it's exactly. not like i was counting exactly so if they would have done one more episode where he's like he's in court but he's also working with vice as to how he's going to clear his name they're going to bring down Algato, who's now desperate to get revenge against sunny and the manolo gang plus commandante salazar is still out there who's now going to try and repartner anyways sorry rice itself is what i'm saying if there was just one more episode, I think <laughs> I think we would have ended this better. At, the whole arc is fantastic. It was it made Vice great again. <laughs> it did. <laughs> it you know, it it came out of nowhere. It did a great job. Evil Sunny is the best Sunny. I just wish we got one more episode of the Amnesia, and then we would button all of this up. But instead, I think we're gonna button it up over a course of like a series of episodes. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Go with the Heat. We would love to hear from you. Where you stand on my opinion on one more episode. If they had one more episode for the Amnesia arc, would that have made the ending to the Amnesia storyline better? Also, I want to hear from you. If you think we're way off base on this, that this is how it should have ended. Now, we're just keep in mind, John and I have not seen the rest of season five. So we don't know what's going to come. That's why we cleared the deck for Melissa to let her get some stuff off her chest. Because <laughs> she does know what happens in the rest mm -hmm. of season five. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can see all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to support us, support step number one. Email us, support step number two. Go to your podcast or platform of choice and give us five stars. iTunes in particular, if you'd want to go to that one, that'd be fantastic. And give us five stars. Do not leave a review. Instead of leaving a review, please let us know. Would you be interested in buying a Morris the Panther t-shirt? <laughs> if so, how much would you pay for a Morris the Panther t-shirt? Just him when they open that door coming out at you. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pal. Like, for real, the first time when I saw the panther, I was like, Babu? <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I did the same thing. <laughs> Babu? <laughs> I was waiting for him to, like, just be on something. <laughs> now I gotta look back to see if Babu like, yeah. in Archer comes up in Archer Vice, in the Archer Vice season. Because that might be a straight-up yeah. reference to Morris. Maybe it is, yeah. I think that is Archer Vice season, because isn't that... They're, yeah, they're trying to sell the drugs... And they're living at Charlene's house. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Is that the first time we've met? We might have met Babu in the season before that, though. Yeah. He comes back. So let's see here. I'm reading about it right now. He first appeared in season two. So yeah, he's pretty early. That's not Archer Vice. Yeah. It wasn't until season four or five that we got Archer Vice. Yeah. Okay. I got my hopes up for nothing, man. <laughs> <laughs>